Okay, this is Beak by Lori Halls Anderson. And this is the first marking period. Welcome to Merriweather High. It is my first morning of high school. I have seven new notebooks, a skirt I hate, and a stomach ache. The school bus wheezes to my corner. The door opens and I step up. I am the first pickup of the day. The driver pulls away from the curb while I stand in the aisle. Where to sit? I've never been a backseat wa waste case. If I sit in the middle, a stranger could sit next to me. If I sit in the front, it will make me look like a little kid but I figure it's the best chance I have to make eye contact with one of my friends if any of them have decided to talk to me yet. The bus picks up students in groups of four or five. As they walk down the aisle, people who are my middle school lab partners or gym buddies glare at me. I close my eyes. This is what I've been dreading. As we leave the last stop, I am the only person sitting alone. The driver downshifts to drag us over the hills. The engine clanks, which makes the guys in the back holler something obscene. Someone is wearing too much cologne. I try to open my window, but the little latches won't move. A guy behind me unwraps his breakfast and shoots the wrapper at the back of my head. It bounces into my lap. A ho-ho. We pass janitors painting over the sign in front of the high school. The school board has decided that Merriweather High, home of the Trojans, didn't send a strong abstinence message, so they have transformed us to the Blue Devils. Better the devil you know than the Trojan you don't, I guess. School colors will stay purple and gray. The board didn't want to spring for new uniforms. Older students are allowed to roam until the bell, but ninth graders are herded into the auditorium. We fell into clans. Jocks, country, clubbers, idiots, savants, cheerleaders, human waste, Euro trash, future fascists of America, big hair chicks, the Marthas, suffering artists, thespians, goths, shredders. I am clanless. I wasted the last weeks of August watching bad cartoons. I didn't go to the mall, the lake, or the pool, or anywhere, or answer the phone. I have entered high school with the wrong hair, the wrong clothes, the wrong attitude, and I don't have anyone to sit with. I am outcast. There is no point looking for my ex-friends. Our clan, the Plain Janes, has splintered and the pieces are being absorbed by rival factions. Nicole lounges with the jocks, comparing scars from summer league sports. Ivy floats between the suffering artists on one side of the aisle and the thespians on the other. She has enough personality to travel with two packs. Jessica has moved to Nevada. No real loss. She was mostly Ivy's friend anyway. The kids behind me laugh so loud I know they're laughing about me. I can't help myself. I turn around. It's Rachel, surrounded by a bunch of kids wearing clothes that most definitely did not come from the East Side Mall. Rachel Bruin, my ex-best friend. She stares at something above my left ear. Words climb up my throat. This was the girl who suffered through brownies with me who taught me how to swim, who understood about my parents, who didn't make fun of my bedroom. If there's anyone in the entire galaxy I am dying to tell what really happened, it's Rachel. My throat burns. Her eyes meet mine for a second. I hate you, she mouths silently. She turns her back to me and laughs with her friends. I bite my lip. I am not going to think about it. It was ugly, but it's over, and I'm not going to think about it. My lip bleeds a little. It tastes like metal. I need to sit down. I stand in the center aisle of the auditorium, a wounded zebra in a National Geographic special looking for someone, anyone, to sit next to. A predator approaches, gray jock buzz cut, whistles around a neck thicker than his head, probably a social studies teacher hired to coach a blood sport. Mr. Neck, sit. I grab a seat. Another wounded zebra turns and smiles at me. She's packing at least five grand worth of orthodontia, but has great shoes. I'm Heather from Ohio, she says. I'm new here. Are you? I don't have time to answer. The lights dim and the indoctrination begins. The first ten lies they tell you in high school. We are here to help you. Two, you will have enough time to get to your class before the bell rings. Three, the dress code will be enforced. 
Four, no smoking is allowed on school grounds. Five, our football team will win the championship this year. Six, we expect more of you here. Seven, guidance counselors are always available to listen. Eight, your schedule was created with your needs in mind. Nine, your locker combination is private. Ten, these will be the years you look back on fondly. My class, my first class is biology. I can't find it and get my first demerit for wandering the hall. It is 8.50 in the morning, only 699 days and seven class periods until graduation. Our teachers are the best, dot, dot, dot. My English teacher has no face. She has uncombed stringy hair that droops on her shoulders. The hair is black from her from her part to her ears and then neon orange, excuse me, to the frizzy ends. I can't decide if she had pissed off her hairdresser or is morphing into a monarch butterfly. I call her hair woman. Hair woman wastes 20 minutes taking attendance because she won't look at us. She keeps her head bent over her desk so her hair flops in front of her face. She spends the rest of class writing on the board and speaking to the flag about our required reading. She wants us to write in our class journals every day but promises not to read them. I write about how weird she is. We have journals and social studies too. The school must have gotten a good price on journals. We are studying American history for the ninth time in nine years. Another review <coughs> of map skills, one week of Native Americans, Christopher Columbus and time for Columbus Day, the pilgrims and time for Thanksgiving, Every year they say we're going to get right up to the present. But we always get stuck in the Industrial Revolution. We got to World War I in 7th grade. Who knew there had been a war with the whole world? We need more holidays to keep the social studies teachers on track. My social studies teacher is Mr. Neck, the same guy who growled at me to sit down in the auditorium. He remembers me fondly. I got my eye on you. Front row. Nice seeing you again, too. I bet he suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, Vietnam or Iraq, one of those TV wars. Spotlight. I find my locker after social studies. The lock sticks a little, but I open it. I dive into the stream of fourth period lunch students and swim down the hall to the cafeteria. I know enough not to bring lunch on the first day of high school. There is no way of telling what the acceptable fashion will be. Brown bags, humble testament to suburbia or terminal geek gear, insulated lunch bags, hip way to save the planet, or sign of an over-involved mother. Buying is the only solution, and it gives me time to scan the cafeteria for a friendly face or an inconspicuous corner. The hot lunch is turkey with reconstituted dried mashed potatoes and gravy, a damp green vegetable and a cookie. I'm not sure how to order anything else, so I just slide my tray along and let the lunch drones fill it. This eight-foot senior in front of me somehow gets three cheeseburgers, french fries, and two ho-hos without saying a word. Some sort of Morse code with his eyes, maybe. Must study this further. I follow the basketball pole into the cafeteria. I see a few friends, people I used to think were my friends, but they look away. Think fast, think fast. There's that new girl, Heather, reading by the window. I could sit across from her, or I could crawl behind a trash can. Or maybe I could dump my lunch straight into the trash and keep moving right on out the door. The basketball pole waves to a table of friends, of course, the basketball team. They all swear at him, a bizarre greeting practiced by athlete boys with zits. He smiles and throws a ho-ho. I try to scoot around him. Thwop. A lump of potatoes and gravy hits me square in the center of my chest. All conversation stops as the entire lunchroom gawks, my face burning into their retinas. I will be forever known as that girl who got nailed by potatoes the first day. The basketball pole apologizes and says something else, but 400 people explode in laughter and I can't read lips. I ditch my tray and bolt for the door. I motor so fast out of the lunchroom, the track coach would draft me for varsity if he were around. But no, Mr. Neck was cafeteria duty, and Mr. Neck has no use for girls who can run the 100 in under 10 seconds unless they're willing to do it while holding on to a football. Mr. Neck. We meet again. Me. It's blank. <laughs> would he listen to, I need to go home and change, or did you see what that bozo did? Not a chance. I keep my mouth shut. 
Mr. Neck. Where do you think you're going? Me. It's blank. It is easier not to say anything. Shut your trap, button your lip, can it? All that crap you hear on TV about communication and expressing feelings is a, is a lie. Nobody really wants to hear what you have to say. Mr. Neck makes a note in his book. I knew you were trouble the first time I saw you. I've taught here for 24 years and I can tell what's going on in a kid's head just by looking in their eyes. No more warnings. You just earned a demerit for wandering the halls without a pass. Sanctuary. Art follows lunch like dream follows nightmare. The classroom is at the far end of the building and has long south-facing windows. The sun doesn't shine much in Sarah. Syracuse, so the art room is designed to get away to get every bit of light it can. It is dusty in a clean dirt kind of way. The floor is layered with dry splotches of paint, the walls plastered with sketches of tormented teenagers and fat puppies. The shelves crowded with clay pots. A radio plays my favorite station. Mr. Freeman is ugly, big old grasshopper body like a stilt walking circus guy. Nose like a credit card sunk between his eyes, but he smiles at us as we file into class. He is hunched over a spinning pot, his hands muddy red. Welcome to the only class that will teach you how to survive, he says. Welcome to art. I sit at a table close to his desk. Ivy is in this class. She sits by the door. I keep staring at her, trying to make her look at me. That happens in movies. People can feel it when other people stare at them, and they just have to turn around and say something. Either Ivy has a great force field, or my laser vision isn't very strong. She won't look back at me. I wish I could sit with her. She knows art. Mr. Freeman turns off the wheel and grabs a piece of chalk without washing his hands. Soul, he writes on the board. The clay streaks the word like dried blood. This is where you can find your soul, if you dare where you can touch that part of you that you've never dared to look at before. Do not come here and ask me to show you how to draw a face. Ask me to help you find the wind. I sneak a peek behind me. The eyebrow telegraph is flashing fast. This guy is weird. He must see it. He must know what we are thinking. He keeps on talking. He says we will graduate knowing how to read and write because we'll spend a million hours learning how to read and write. I could agree, I could argue that point. Mr. Freeman, why, why not spend that time on art, painting, sculpting, charcoal, pastel, oils? Are words or numbers more important than images? Who decided this? Does algebra move you to tears? Hands raised, thinking he wants answers. Can the plural possessive express the feelings in your heart? If you don't learn art now, you will never learn to breathe. There is more. For someone who questions the value of words, he sure uses a lot of them. I tune out for a while and come back when he holds up a huge globe that is missing half of the north, northern hemisphere. Can anyone tell me what this is? He asks. A globe? Ventures a voice in the back. Mr. Freeman rolls his eyes. Was it an expensive sculpture that some kid dropped and he had to pay for it out of his own money or they didn't let him graduate? Asks another. Mr. Freeman sighs. No imagination. What are you, 13, 14? You've already let them beat your creativity out of you. This is an old globe I used to let my daughters kick around my studio when it was too wet to play outside. One day, Jenny put her foot right through Texas and the United States crumbled into the sea, and voila, an idea. This broken ball could be used to express such powerful visions. You could paint a picture of it with people fleeing out from the hole with a wet-muzzled dog chewing Alaska. The opportunities are endless. It's almost too much, but you are important enough to give it to. Huh? You will each pick a piece of paper out of the globe. He walks around the room so we can pull red scraps from the center of the earth. On the paper, you will find one word, the name of an object. I hope you like it. You will spend the rest of the year learning how to turn that object into a piece of art. You will sculpt it. You will sketch it paper mache it, carve it. If the computer teacher is talking to me this year, you can use the lab for computer-aided designs. But there's a catch. By the end of the year, you must figure out how to make your object say something, express an emotion, speak to every person who looks at it. Some people groan. 
My stomach flutters. Can he really let us do this? It sounds like too much fun. He stops at my table. I plunge my hand into the bottom of the globe and fish out my paper. Tree. Tree? It's too easy. I learned how to draw a tree in second grade. I reach in for another piece of paper. Mr. Freeman shakes his head. Ah, 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 he says. You just chose your destiny. You can't change that. He pulls a bucket of, cl of clay from under the pottery wheel, breaks off fist-sized balls, and tosses one to each of us. Then he turns up the radio and laughs. Welcome to the journey.